Welcome to the Music Ed Matters podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Emily Williams Birch, and this podcast, it exists for you. Whether you're a music lover, an educator, a choir member, each week we bring guests to the show to help explore what matters in music. I'm so glad that you're here. Welcome to the show. Today on the podcast, we welcome composer and educator Dr. Andrea Ramsey. If you've ever performed any of Dr. Ramsey's compositions, you know your singers love it. Her music is so much fun to sing, it's a joy to teach, and there is always something to touch and inspire your audiences. In today's conversation, you'll learn who Dr. Ramsey is, where she came from, where she gets her inspiration. She'll offer some advice and tips for aspiring composers, because you know we all have a few of those in our choirs. She also gives us some suggestions and ideas as we, as teachers and directors, approach her music and bring it to our ensembles. And then we dive deep into her latest work, her first ever extended work, The Suffrage Cantata. There are so many life-relatable parallel moments in this conversation, and sitting down to talk with Andrea Ramsey was such a dream come true. Before I let you get to the show, remember this podcast is brought to you by our friends over at the Kennison Choral Company. You can empower your singers by giving them the opportunity to rehearse their music effectively outside of your rehearsal time. Their choral rehearsal tracks allow for just that, fine-tuning the foundation of your repertoire with the sounds of real voices. And because you're a Music Ed Matters podcast listener, you can save 20% off. Just use Music Matters at checkout, and the rest is history. Speaking of great music, let's talk to Dr. Andrea Ramsey. Today on the podcast, we are welcoming Dr. Andrea Ramsey. Hello! Hello! (laughs) I'm so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for being here. I'm glad to be here. I have to tell you, before before we actually introduce you, I have to tell you how I found your music. Andrea Ramsey is an amazing composer. You're going to find about, out all about her in a second. But I think I was in my second year of teaching, and I picked Grow Little Tree for a piece for my children's choir. And the front cover of that tells a story. And I am dying to know how true this story is. It says something like, it was one of your first pieces, and the, the publishers wouldn't take it because it was, quote, too easy. Did that really happen? Yeah, I mean, I can give you. <laughs> Do you want that story? Like, oh, it was, I, mean, I be... told I used that the whole year as it doesn't matter if people tell you you can't publish, <laughs> you keep going because look at what she's doing now. Like, you were our go-to. We can do anything model that whole year. I oh, said, be well, like it... Andrea Ramsey all the time. That was our thing. It's a really simple piece, and it was written for that purpose because it was written for a summer camp of sixth graders who'd never been in choir before. So they're experiencing choir for the first time. So we thought we we're going to write this little tune that they can sing and feel excited because it has a lot of imitation. And mm-hmm. um, yeah, and then the first publisher rejected it. And I may have sent it to a second. I can't remember, but I think I took that as a cue and I just thought, you know, maybe I don't want to put it out there because I had another established composer tell me, you know, you need to publish like half of what you write and make sure it's the good half. And which I, I think I haven't necessarily followed that advice. <laughs> but maybe I should have. Don't do that. But, uh, you love your but uh, I, I didn't. Um, yeah. I don't, so I just sort of, so just sort of sat there. And then one of my friends uh, performed it and they had a YouTube video of it. And then of course, all these people were like, how do I get this? Where do I, you know, and a lot of it had to do with their staging of young and old students and mm-hmm. sort of sharing that idea of growing. But anyway, I that's great. That piece. I know that's a super early piece and you have so much good music. I have She as one of those pieces on my list every year that I wait to see if I have a choir that can handle enough parts to sing that one. It's on <laughs> my list. That's from what, 2017 or 18, 18 maybe? Oh, I, I, you, you will know yours better than that's I will. oh it's such a good piece and the suffrage cantata okay i'm getting too excited we have to tell the listeners who is dr andrea ramsey <laughs> um i i am an arkansas born um composer and conductor and have a teacher's heart i'm really missing teaching right now because <laughs> this is because the pandemic has made it so that i can't you know get out like I used to. So, um, but no, I I grew up in Arkansas, um, public school educated, big believer in public education. I, um, because those were all of my opportunities came from state funded schools and scholarships. And, you know, my parents were blue collar. My dad worked for the railroad. My mom stayed home until 
I was probably in ninth grade when she started work um, at the DMV, like this was her, you know, and they both like made huge sacrifices for my brother and I to have opportunities in music. Um, my mom always wanted to play piano, but her family always told her it's too expensive. You can't do that. And so she made sure that I had on and off piano lessons with the, you know, whoever the cheapest church piano lady was in town. <laughs> and then I would quit and then I would try again. And I was not a great piano student at all, but, um, but yeah, I grew up, um, in that situation, and then and then I'm, we moved into a different town, and that choir was phenomenal. And I, I thought this is, I think this is what I, I won't want to do. I mean, I think this is how I could pay for college. I think I was trying to find my way to figure out, and I just loved singing, and I thought I want to give this to other people. So I really didn't set out necessarily to be a composer as much as a teacher, and then the composing was sort of this side thing that started probably honestly probably when I was a bad piano student because I just wanted to make up sounds at the piano or add things to my pieces instead of practicing what I was supposed to do um, and my senior year of high school was the first time I tried to write a piece for choir and it was really geeky but we were we were singing William Byrd's Ave Verum Corpus which is mm -hmm. you know just like this warm bath of renaissance glory and I I, I thought, I'm going to write my own Ave Verum Corpus. So like, this is the only sacred Latin text that I had access to, like we're singing right now. So I just took that text and I went home with my Yamaha keyboard drawing staff paper because at that point I didn't even have any printed staff paper. And it took like a whole year. I don't know what I was doing, but it's actually in print, which I'm not sure is a good thing either. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go find that now that I know. Then revised, yeah, yeah, Opus One, because um, an editor was like, do you have anything that's not? I was like, I'll send you some things. And then they, they picked it and I was like, I don't know. But okay. What a beautiful story to come from. I know you're, you in your bio, you write so much about the power of music and you are just such the epitome of the power of music taking you to find your dreams and impact lives. It's so cool. Thank you for sharing all that. Oh yeah, no, sure. I don't know if I actually answered your question. I feel like I chased mm -hmm. rabbits from my now childhood. You, but. <laughs> I have a little bit better feeling of who Dr. Ramsey is. How did, um, how did you know that composing was gonna take over from teaching? Because it is evident in your music that teaching is your heart. So how did you find composing? Was it a balancing act? When did you go full time? Those type of questions. Um, yeah, so I was teaching, I taught in the public schools for eight years, and then I went to get some graduate education and taught collegiate level uh, at Ohio State and University of Colorado Boulder for four years. Um, and, and it was, it's, I don't know, sort of like how, how something starts to consume more and more of your time. And actually, all of us as teachers have to be careful of this, because we always add things to the train of duties that we have. Mm -hmm. We're not always taking cars away, though, but we're always mm -mm. adding things. And so we have to be careful about that. And so I love composing, and it was a real outlet for me creatively. Um, but I was finding it difficult, especially in higher ed, where the expectation was that you, you go and you're clinicking. So I'm gone on a lot of weekends and coming back and playing catch up with my students and trying to finish commissions. And I, I started to feel just a bit like I was on this hamster wheel. And I thought, I, I, there should be space for actual life, too, <laughs> like not just work. And so that was um, leading toward it. And then I had a, I actually had a, a meal sit down occasionally cross paths with people when you're at different places and was doing something in Iowa and Jake Rinstead was there and so we had dinner and we're just chatting about stuff and I said talk to me about this you know you're living the dream you're doing this full-time component and he goes you would want you want to do this and I said maybe I don't know and then he's this old soul I mean he's younger than I am full-time composer but he very much you know sort of said well, what are you scared of and then he's like you should so you could so do this and so he sort of walked me through making it kind of made me realize that I was we're sort of we put ourselves on these tracks and we don't always think about other possibilities and when I went home and I started looking at numbers and thinking about what how this and I finally was like I think I can do this and so now it's been it'll be four years this summer that I've been doing full-time composing and guest conducting although this last year just composing because right. there are there is no guest conducting right now unless you're just meeting with but I have met a lot of choirs on zoom we, we do a lot of I bet that's beautiful so you really said a lot in that one little bit that I want to restate one thing okay you said what are you scared of that was what Jake asked you and I bet there are so many people listening right now myself included sometimes you just stay on the track adding train cars to the train tracks yeah. 
yeah. thinking, yeah, I'm just going to keep going ahead. But what are you scared of to like diverge off the tracks? I think that that is such a great statement. It has nothing to do with what we sat down to talk about, but it's beautiful. Oh, I and love. everything I would share that I was scared of, he would sort of shoot down or get me to think about it in an alternate way. And, and it, it's true. Yeah. <laughs> you really can do it. That is so yeah. cool. Okay. So you decide to take this jump off the tracks and go full-time composing and guest clinicking all over the place. So what inspires you to write now? You're doing commissions, but also what inspires you? Where do you find your inspiration? You know, I, I mean, there are certain things that always feel more inspirational to me than others, but I really do believe that we can find inspiration anywhere if we're paying attention. Mm. Um, I mean, if you and I sat down and decided to, to, you know, take inspiration from one of those industrial folding metal chairs, you know, like we could stare at it long enough and probably come up with something, you know, there's, there's, there are angles, there's metal, there's how did that get there? What's the function of it? Who invented it? You know, I mean, there's all of these, but we just have to ask questions and pay attention. And so uh, I used to think, and I still, I do believe that my travels influence the creativity. I think the more that you're seeing and you're taking in, like all of that stuff gets connected. But since the pandemic, I've been finding that I have to make myself I, obviously I'm not traveling. So I do other things. I take walks in the neighborhood and try to notice deeply in my neighborhood, or I watch documentaries on things I don't know about, or um, I was trying to think, <laughs> I bought, I don't know, I, I'm going to share this though, like one of my treats to myself when I finished the summer cantata was I bought an Oculus Quest, which do you know what that is? <laughs> yes, like, I do. <laughs> my, one of my best friends has one, and my husband and him play all the time. Honestly, like I was looking for really I didn't initially I was just trying to find a virtual reality headset because I miss travel so much I was like maybe I can find something that will take me That's somewhere genius. and then I realized well this is like a gaming system but I can't but there's an app on there called wonder and you can go anywhere google maps goes and it has a random feature so you just click random and it'll plop you in the middle of a field in Slovenia or somewhere that you don't even know where you are oh, and so I that's my I hope my husband's thing. not listening he has been wanting one of those for so long oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> and I know whenever he searches it, because it starts popping up on my phone that he's been searching. <laughs> now, you know, Big Brother's watching. I can't believe you got one, but you're right. You have to that be was, willing. I thought if I finished, that was a present. It was like, when I finish this work, if I do it, then then I will give myself the reward of being able to, to go anywhere. To visit. Well, and the fun game, though, has been putting it on and hitting that random thing. And then just wandering around trying to figure out where I am uh, has been... Uh, I don't know, a, a, a weird way, but a nice way to sort of stimulate some creativity. Right. Just, but you're, yeah. you said all the things. You have to be willing to look for it and open to look for it because you can find it mm -hmm. in your gaming system or on a metal chair <laughs> or on the cloud in the sky when you just lay on your back and look at the, the ceiling. But you have to be willing to look for it and ask, ask questions. The yeah. willingness and the questioning is so important. Ooh, okay, this is getting good. So you get inspiration from lots of different places. Um, I would say nature is a big influence in a lot of my pieces. I mean, just because I grew up in the country, travel, um, you know, and, and things that matter. Uh, I mean, I have plenty of pieces about things that don't matter as well, because I think, well, everything, I guess, matters to some degree, but some things are silly, and sometimes you just want to have fun, but, mm -hmm. but, um, but yeah, also, like, you know, I think there's inspiration everywhere, that was. Yes, yeah. oh, I, like I hope you all are listening, there is inspiration everywhere, even if you are in the middle of, what are we calling this, pandemic fry, or pandemic overload, or fatigue, there is still inspiration to be found if you purposely look for it. That's, that's inspiring in and of itself. Okay, once you have this idea, what's your, your typical process? I mean, that's like asking me how I teach a song. What's your typical composition process? <laughs> Well, and it, it is different each time a little bit, but I would say the bulk of the time, probably eight out of 10 times, I'm starting with the text. So I, I do a lot of searching for poetry, prose, um, historical documents, like, I don't know, whatever I could turn into a choral piece. So I'm always sort of on the look for, for those texts that will work with the project. And then um, once I find a text that resonates or that the commissioner agrees to and we have that, and then I'm, I'm sort of living with that text. So a lot of times the beginning parts of it, um, I liken to 
like a musical version of playing with Play-Doh, right? You're, you know, you make a shape and if you like it, great. If you don't, you just smush it out and you try again. And so the, the musical version of that is just saying those words, like what's the natural rhythm there? You know, every phrase has, um, you know, I mean, if, if, if we were going to set to music, um, I am on your podcast. Like if that is our lyric, okay. <laughs> there's, there's a, I am on your podcast, bada bada bada. Like there's a rhythm, but I make, can make a decision. Do I want to keep that? I am on your podcast. I could, it's not very, you know, and it's good for getting through a lot of lyrics fast, but then you'd like play with, you know, well, what words would I want to emphasize? And cause you can do that by making the word longer or higher or whatever. And then it's just what, like playing with sound and singing ideas, singing melodic ideas. And then I will, I'll take my phone, I'll put it on voice memo and I'll record while I'm improvising things. And uh, because occasionally you'll have a good idea and you'll be like, oh, I forgot what that was. And then it's there. Um, And then once I feel like I have some melodic content that I really like, I'll go um, to the piano and I'll start to think about, you know, there will initially, I feel like with me, and this is not with, I mean, everybody has different processes. And, and I think it's really fun to look at, I think it was Aaron Copeland who codified some of these and, and talked about the fully inspired composer and the mess, you know, but for me, I like, I start with these little fragments and then as I'm starting to play with them, we'll get some really clear harmonic ideas at first, just of like, you're listening to that and maybe you hear a counter melody or hear some little fill in the piano. And so I'll kind of sketch out those things that come to me first and then go back in and fill, um, you know, whether it's the piano or the other voice parts uh, accordingly. And and it kind of works like that. So you you do a little bit of melody, you catch the harmonies up, you have a little more melody and stuff. And I would say that's the bulk of the time. Occasionally, I get really stuck. Like there's a piece I have for children's choir called Sing to Me that um, was n- not written in that way. Um, yeah. Because I <laughs> I labored and labored. I was going around like, sing to me, sing to me. I like was making up all of these, none of these melodies were working and I was just getting annoyed. And so one day I just sort of had the text in mind and sat down at the piano and just started improvising a little at the piano play. And I'm not a great pianist, but this little, I had this idea in the piano. And then out of that, I just floated over it, those three repeated notes. Yeah, that's it, like, that's it, those three notes. And and I never would have thought at the beginning to like, let's make the melody exactly the same, but in the context, it worked. And so sometimes there are, there's another piece I wrote in this pandemic um, for, and I'm so excited for whenever they actually get to perform it, but um, Scott Leadhead with Coca Capelli in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Mm-hmm. Um, we did a set called uh, Songs for, oh my gosh. Why can't I remember the name of it right now? There are like two pieces. I want to say they're so- Songs for Unexpected Spaces. Yes. I was going to say open and I was like, I don't think it's open. And the first one is, is meant to be sung outdoors in a field. And the other is meant to be sung in a parking garage. And because those are the places like that are available to us, right? And the parking garage one uses the parking garage for percussion, but that was the first time I, I wrote that piece because I knew the percussion was gonna, yeah, drumsticks on concrete and pipes. And, you know, he went and had his students bang around on things so we could find different timbres. And, um, and so, but that piece, I, I never done this before, but I wrote the rhythmic skeleton first. I was just like with the text. So I had basically like, just texts and rhythms. And I knew that I wanted these rhythms because the percussion was so important. And then I went back and found pitches to put on so the rhythms. So basically you are telling us that you are a freestyle rapper for that song. <laughs> you oh, were yeah. a rapper. Well, you were 100%. You were 7-8. Yeah. seven eight, but yeah. Seven, eight, but yeah it was, <laughs> <laughs> it's like mix. well, not just 7-8, it's mixed meter, but like, yeah, a lot of ace. So, oh, yeah. I can't wait to hear that. You'll have to keep us posted when that goes goes live for sure. Yeah. Well, I need to check in with him. I think it got too cold. They were going to film a video. And well, I then... guess Canada. Okay, so you get inspiration from nature. You have a, a normal text first process. I love that you've overcome. I just want to acknowledge the fact that you overcame quitting piano lessons so many times and you can now write your own harmonic structures. So those people listening uh-huh. that have been trying oh. to master... <laughs> Don't ask me to play it. I'm not, I'm still not a pianist, but you know, I know enough to survive. Yeah. That's all that matters. You, you found a way to make your place. 
So what I have some some young composers in my choirs. They're just obsessed with writing their own stuff. What advice would you give to middle school, high school age singers that are potentially considering composing? Mm. Keep, I mean, listen to tons of music and different music, but, but like kind of follow your passion. Like one of the things that you're really interested in. And, and so listening is important. I think hearing as much music, whether it's concerts, um, piano is really important. Um, even though I'm not the best example, but I, you know, that's the thing is you need enough to, to survive those music classes. Um, I think, you know, the other thing, and this is every young composer. I did it too. When I was first getting started a little bit too, you, you tend to have sounds that you love and you try to emulate. And so we get a lot of people who are writing things that sound like their favorite, you know, insert favorite composer here. And and I think it took me a while to kind of realize, like, I should just write what I'm, and I still don't, I mean, I think there's still times that sound, other sounds find their way in, but I, I think that's a pitfall that a lot of young composers can fall into, is trying to sound exactly like somebody. And if you're trying to, you know, write the piece that sounds exactly like Eric Whitaker, well, we already have an Eric Whitaker right now. So you should write the thing that sounds like you and you have a voice and it's going to, develop over time as you listen to more things and you know but just to think about that and I also think um listening I don't know there's the older I get too like I find that listening is different now like I want to hear things that I haven't heard before Mm -hmm. and but I feel like when I was young when I was in I would say probably ninth grade through maybe my first four years of teaching those years to me feel like the most influential in terms of uh being really formative listening mm-hmm. i don't know if that makes sense but I, do you feel it's that actually, way it's a research thing actually it's published oh really it's your musical prime age 15 to about 23 to 26 depending on where you are in your adventures um but it's your driving years especially because it's when you remember being in the car and it's all this uh-huh. nostalgia. so the the years of 15 to 26 and it was research done a lot with going back and using music with alzheimer's patients and such and what wow. music would resonate with them and it was from those mm-hmm. formative years, those years. So you, yeah. you are spot on that's crazy. Well, I, maybe I read it somewhere and forgot about it, but I yeah. think that that's amazing. We read a lot. <laughs> we read a lot. <laughs> you, you're also dropping, I just want to highlight the fact that you keep dropping these amazing life lessons within everything you're saying. Like find purpose, cre- ask questions, create the space, keep trying, don't give up, listen to lots of things and be yourself. I think that is a message that we can't get into our choir members and our students enough that it's okay to be you. You don't have to be anybody else. Well, and I think part of that is sort of self-serving and self-healing for me, because I think for so long, I didn't feel that way. Like, I think, I mean, I think so many of us, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, I think particularly women, sometimes it's a struggle to like step into your own identity because we're sort of socialized especially as Southern women, that it's always sort of polite and deferential. And I, we say sorry a lot more than we actually mean sorry. Yes. And so, yeah, so there's like those kinds of things too. So a lot of this is like sort of saying to young people, you know, I, I waited too long to make these decisions that really changed my world. Because I think when I started stepping into my own skin, um, that's when I think things started to go more. Mm. Uh, musically so oh that's beautiful and it's been a process it was never like a moment and there's no No, it's it's still one second but it's it's so nice that you're able to share this and show us that it's okay to explore and find your skin but you'll be your best self when you're in your skin totally I love this okay so we've given advice to young composers what about people that program your music? If you could talk to every single person who ever programmed your music, what are some things you'd want to say? <laughs> I love the smile on your face right now. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't, um, that's really hard to answer. Because... You don't have to answer it. I threw it at you as a curveball because I was wondering because I want to do she so badly. No, you don't have to answer I, it. I, mean, but... I, I have generic, I mean, like, obviously each piece has its own thing that I could talk about but but so so some of this is just much broader than it would be but uh but for me the I get asked a lot how do you feel you know if you hear do you ever hear performances of your pieces and you go oh that was really rough or oh that was I wish I had you know or I wish I could have conducted that and and 
And I, I say that like for me, like the core of it is, is if there is intent and if there is effort, like if you see singers who are putting their guts into it and maybe it's still not something that's going to hit a national ACDA stage or be flawless or whatever, but the heart is there and the intent is there and they're giving their best. Like I can't, I, I won't ever fault that if it's your best and I can tell that they've worked toward their best and there's heart in it. So, I mean, I think mostly what I, I would want people to do is to make sure that there's intent in the singing, that we understand the text, that we're trying to convey and share something and with an audience rather than just sing at them, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so those, those are things that grab me. And I, I don't, I often, um, some composers will say, uh, you know, they'll have really specific ways of doing and being, I really think that conducting and composing for me sometimes are annoyingly separate things to where I'll write a piece I will feel really good about the tempo marking. I will feel really good about some of the decisions that I made expressively. And then the first time I actually conduct that piece with an all state or something, I will go, ah, this is not the right tempo. Like we're gonna do this. And then it, it'll just in the moment shift because I, it, it's a different thing. And, and, and sometimes pieces, you know, so I guess that's the other thing I would say is you have freedom to adjust tempo markings because I know some of them are not. <laughs> You know, and, and, and one of my mentors at Michigan State used to say, like, sometimes a piece just has a tempo. And when you find that tempo, everything else locks. Mm -hmm. uh, and it and it's, could be a really subtle change, but it can, can reduce some problems. So just to give people that kind of freedom as well. All right. I've made the mental notes. Convey the message. <laughs> try your very hardest. Make sure the text is conveyed. Don't sing at the audience. And pick a tempo that works for your ensemble, your space, that makes it come to life the best that you can. That's great. How'd so I do? Right. Yes. I feel very, feel very <laughs> equipped. One of my favorite Benjamin Britten quotes is he always said he wrote music that he wanted people to want to perform. He said he wanted to be that type of composer where you just wanted to sing his stuff. And I feel like all of your stuff is singable. And I think it's because I heard you sing for um, one of the national ACDA children's groups. I was managing the group and you came in and did a thing and you sang. And I just remember I was working my tail off at a computer and I looked up because there's so much body in your sound. So do you find that you sing your style into the music and how does your singing voice play into who you are as a composer? Yeah, well, I have to be careful because sometimes, um, well, even like, <laughs> sometimes I will leave it there, but sometimes because, and I, this is all composers really, if you're a baritone or a mezzo, when you go to, to create melody, typically those melodies are going to be in your sweet spot register wise. So that was something I had to learn early on was to bump the key up <laughs> of some of my melodies so that I, well, because you're not a by melody. Yeah. And so initially some of my pieces would be pitched too low and the basses were like really low. And that's, you know, so you just think like, that seems like such an obvious thing now that was really early. Like, but I, I think I, I do sing, the parts and I do try and sing through the part of every piece that I write just to make sure that it feels you know and I'll I'll just sing with the accompaniment and and if if I'm struggling um in some places I'll look at that and sometimes mm -hmm. it's just I'm struggling because it's new and I haven't sung that part even though I wrote it and sometimes I'm struggling because there's a hiccup or there's something in the accompaniment that's wonky or that I could do to make and so anytime I can make it better why not make it better because all of us know as teachers the times that we have fought the battle and paid the price for a piece <laughs> and felt like it was unnecessary like why didn't they just do this so that it didn't have to be this way and, and I have plenty of those moments too but I try to eliminate as many as I can catch. Um, I'd like you to know that that's another life lesson you just dropped within there just just in case you have lost track of these amazing life lessons that you are giving us through your life, the power <laughs> of music, if I shall quote you directly. Sometimes you put things in the wrong place and you just move them. Mm -hmm. That seems so simple, but wow, what a profound thing to think about. If it's not working, if it doesn't feel right, then move it. <laughs> that's, that's really great but, life advice. Because sometimes it's something that you have in the piano that just throws something off that you didn't, you know, or... There, there's some weird voice leading that you can adjust, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, that sometimes the weird voice leading is the hardest part. I have another question. This is a tough one. How do you want to be remembered as a composer? 
Oh my gosh. It's a really powerful question to ponder. It's, it's almost painful. It's almost painful to, to ponder that question. I mean, I think at the core of it is just the idea of, of making a difference somehow. And, and, and I feel like I do myself a disservice if I try to get too specific about what that difference is, mm. if that makes sense. Because I think sometimes if you're, if you're a teacher, if you're a composer, if you're a scholar, if you're, I mean, whatever, whatever hats you wear in this music world, um, there are lots of different ways to make differences. And I think right now with so many teachers on Zoom or socially distanced or whatever, there are lots of differences being made just purely by connection by care, mm -hmm. by intent. Um, and, and that's different than, you know, taking a, you know, an all state choir through their paces and feeling like they nailed it on the concert and, you know, yes. and, and, but no, by, I mean, I would say more valuable maybe. I mean, I don't know. I remember my all state experiences, like those, those experiences that I had as a singer, but they're primarily things that happen in rehearsal. They're moments that brought mm -hmm. us together or that made the music come alive in some fresh way. And I do remember some about the concert, but it really wasn't about that. Mm -mm. Um, it was about the rehearsal. And so I think it's the journey. And I think it's, if my music does something along that journey to open someone, you know, if the text can be a portal to something greater, if um, someone in the audience needs to hear something that's being sung in that moment if you know I, I think those small things are what are what I would hope and I and I honestly I feel like so much of just being able to do what I'm doing um my parents just would be so thrilled you know uh, oh. with that so I just yeah I don't know is that I, I think, think yeah that's a perfect answer <laughs> you want to make a difference I think you've already made such a big difference like for me um, Dr. Madsen at Florida State always talks about having those ex aesthetic experiences in music, and that's what mm -hmm. keeps us coming back to the profession. And every time that opening passage of Sing to Me happens, it's one of those moments. Like it brings something deep into my soul, whether it's because of the first choir that I did that song with, or mm -hmm. if it's just because of the key, there is something in there that just sparks my desire to do this profession. So that's just one of the, so I feel like you have so achieved that goal. I just was wondering what your, what you hope your legacy would be. And I think that you are totally leaving that legacy. Well, I hope, I hope so. That's a, that's a great question to ponder and something that feels like should be refreshed every so often. Like, I'm mm -hmm. glad that you shared that with me because I thought, I think I need to think about that, especially in a pandemic where my days just blur together. I get up, I open the blinds. <laughs> in the evening, mm -hmm. I close the blinds, I go to bed. Like, I'm in this. <laughs> so, you know, thinking about, you know, in the mundane of the day to day, what do I want? What do I want my legacy to be? And what am I doing today? To reach that. Regard? Yeah, uh, really, it's a great thought. Hey, speaking of legacy, can we can we talk about the suffrage cantata? Yeah, absolutely. What do you, tell me what you want to know? I am um... well. I think the last time that I heard you speak, you were talking about taking on such a big project. Yeah. Was this your longest work to date? Yes, I hadn't made. I mean, pr prior to suffrage cantata, the longest piece I had was a little over six minutes. It was just a it was a treble piece with organ, and. Um, and that was just because I was long-winded with the piece. It was really supposed to be under five minutes. And I called the commissioner and said, can I make this longer? It just feels right. And they're like, yeah, go for it. And so, um, but suffrage, I knew I always wanted to write an extended work. I also knew that I probably would never do that if I was still in academia. I think it was just too hard to try and navigate mm -hmm. um, teaching. And so when I left, that was one of the things that I hoped to check off was I'm going to write extended work and specifically for treble choirs, because there are so many treble choirs in the US. And because we don't, we have a lot of extended works for mixed chorus, but not so much um, for treble. And, uh, and I thought about this idea of, of the journey to women getting the right to vote in the US, which is something I knew very little about, but I thought would be a great opportunity to learn more. So I sort of committed to this idea of it before really digging in. And then <laughs> once you just begin to scratch the surface, you realize, I mean, this is 72 years and more. I'm more than 70, 72 years we kind of mark, but like more than 72 years of struggle 
you know, Susan B. Anthony, who is the only person that I really knew about in the movement prior to starting this piece, she sort of mentioned in the textbook and then women could vote Susan B. Anthony. And that was all I got in my education. Um, she wasn't even alive when the amendment that was named after her was passed. I mean, she was gone at this point. This, this is a torch that had been passed forward from women to more women to more women. And then there were layers beyond that because some of the, the women in the leadership who were really revered or who have been revered by history books um, even excluded the women of color who were in the movement, who were suffragists. And so, um, so that was another layer to the digging. And so when I started it, I knew, I mean, I started reading some things, but it was so much that I thought I have to get an overview. So I took um, trips to DC and to Rochester, New York. Um, and yes. I went a long weekend in DC and I don't know how many steps I logged. I was like <laughs> in and out of every, cause they were, they were, they were running exhibits for the anniversary of the passage of the 19th amendment. And then we were writing our piece for the anniversary of the ratification of the 19th amendment, which was the following year. So I, I saw, you know, at the Library of Congress, the National Archives, the National Portrait Gallery, all these exhibits took photos and notes, well, where I could, some places wouldn't allow it. And then um, toured the Belmont Poly Quality House, which is, was the former headquarters of the National Women's Party, which is an amazing monument that I didn't even know was in DC until I went there. And it was so cool to wander in there and talk with them and then, and then in Rochester saw Susan B. Anthony's house and mm -hmm. went to the university and held letters by her and Carrie Chapman Catt and Lucy Stone and these amazing um, women. And that sort of gave me a, a big overview. And I thought, okay, now I kind of know some of the things that I might want to drill down on and see what I can find. But it was a good, I mean, I didn't start really writing the work until March of 2020, but I started researching it in August of mm -hmm. 20, would that have been August of 2019? And then um, and then it was just like a lot of simmer time and I started making file folders of different categories that I might do. And Once you came back from Washington and you had all of this overview and information, you had your file folders, where did you go from there? How did you start the movements? How did you decide how many movements were gonna be in your cantata? Why is it a cantata? Why did you choose that, that genre? Yeah, yeah. So those are a lot of questions. Sorry. Um, cantata, no, no, I use the name, I, I use that very loosely. I didn't want to get too locked into a form and a cantata can be lots of things. Um, but I also wanted to say, this is not just, this is a bigger thing, you know? And um, I knew there were a few things that jumped out at me early on that I thought this is going to be something that, I, I mean, a few stories that that grabbed me. And then it was like, deciding, you know, is there enough here for this to be a full movement? Should I pull in some other elements? I always thought it was going to be um, somewhere between four and six movements. But then when I really started thinking about what that looked like, it made sense to have five movements because I sort of engineered it like a musical palindrome. So there's some returning material. There's some similar material between movement one and five and movement two and four. And then movement three is standalone. It's got its own sort of thing. And so um, and it's kind of cool. Some of the things came full circle completely by accident and I got really lucky. But one of the things that was really full circle between movements one and five was this quote by Lydia Maria Child, where she said, deeply have I felt the deg degradation of being a woman, not the degradation of being what God made woman, but what man has mm. made her. And um, this idea, which is a pretty heavy thing to start with, and the opening is very weighty and sort of almost... I don't want to compare it to Bach because it is not Bach, but it has that sort of gravitas of, you know, a kind of start. But then when I got to the end and I was trying to wrap up the fifth movement and talk about, I mean, we've passed the 19th amendment at this point, it's been ratified. There are all of these things um, to sort out. And I found a beautiful quote by Ovida Idar, who was a suffragist who was doing work in Mexico, like, right in Texas on the Mexico border, she was writing a paper in Spanish for women's rights and things like this. And the translation um, of her, her line is like, spoke to this idea of woman is no longer a servant, 
um, but equal to man. The hour, the hour of degradation has passed. Woman is no longer a servant, but yeah. equal to man. So the, the word degradation came back in this weird sort of full circle way. And that's a really long story to tell. But all of the text in the piece, with the exception of one phrase in movement one and a section of lyrics in movement three that I, I wrote, all of the rest of the texts are from speeches, documents, letters that these women wrote that have in some instances been paraphrased to be more mm -hmm. lyrical. So Susan B. Anthony, her writing was very verbose, sometimes redundant. I mean, she was smart, but uh, it was not lyric ready. So some of that was adapted, but the, the first movement is really focusing in on early women's rights perspectives, um, sort of centering particularly on the land that's known as New York, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, but also those women's lived experiences because you have white women who were feeling oppressed and fussing about it over tea with each other. And then you had um, black women who had just been emancipated mm -hmm. as of 1837. And so Sojourner Truth, Harriet Jacobs, some of these women were starting to speak and tell their stories. And then you had the Haudenosaunee, which was something that was totally new to me, which, you know, the French and English terms, Iroquois, we know those terms more than Haudenosaunee, but the Haudenosaunee population, their, their women had equality. Like they owned property, they wore comfortable clothing, they farmed, and all of these women would have seen that and would have interacted with them in different ways. And so there's, there's a bit of something to be said there for how that might have influenced some of those early um, women's rights activists to sort of see in wow. um, the kind of thing that was going on there. So anyway, um, the second movement is centered on Susan B. Anthony. The third movement is centered on Ida B. Wells, who became my favorite um, character, I think, in character figure, historical figure in this, um, and her, her efforts, but also her integration of the 1913 parade where she marched with Illinois, even though they told her to go to the back of the parade. And uh, she, well, she left and they thought that she had gone to the back of the parade. And then once the parade got going, she stepped right up front with two of her white friends from Chicago or allies from Chicago and linked arms that and awesome. marched the whole way. So movement four is, was the hardest to write because um, it encompasses two big pieces of the movement, but the silent sentinels, these women who would stand in front of the gates of the White House for the first ever White House protest like this, right? And women also didn't pick it. Like this was not a thing that they did. They weren't saying a word, they're just holding their banners. You know, Mr. President, what will you do for women's suffrage? You know, Mr. President, you say you're for democracy and that's, you know, that's all well and good, but half of your citizens aren't, you know, able to voice their their thoughts mm -hmm. here. And 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 it was fine. And, and I mean, a few people scoffed at them at first or maybe they get some insults or something unpleasant every so often, but it was fine until the U.S. entered World War I. And then at that point, this became, people started to say, this looks treasonous, this is unpatriotic, this is not a good look. And so these men would come out and like throw things or tear the banners off or, you know, kick the women or punch them or, you know, and when the cops showed up, they started arresting the women, not the men who were doing these things. And and somewhere like around 500 women over a two year span were arrested and imprisoned. And some of these women were sentenced to terms as long as six or seven months in really horrific conditions. Um, and I mean, we're talking like, it's, I mean, it's dark. And there's a book that I always tell people if you're wanting to read more and to learn more, Jailed for Freedom is a great place to start because it's a small read, mm -hmm. but it's firsthand accounts of these women who were imprisoned. I have goosebumps just thinking about all this. So some of their, yeah, some of their stories were, were amazing. So I start with the Sentinels and then sort of goes into um, some of the other stories and, and then into the imprisonment and some of the abuses that they endured. And, and then the fifth movement is the ratification of the 19th Amendment, which is in itself a really interesting story because Tennessee was the 36th state to ratify. So all eyes were sort of on Nashville and, and this, this young freshman senator, Harry Byrne, who was, um, I think maybe 26, he was the youngest senator there. And he had a red rose on his lapel, which they called it the War of the Roses. A yellow rose meant that you were for suffrage, a red meant that you were against it. And he was wearing a red rose, but when they called the vote, he, he said, I, and everybody sort of gasped, like, did he make a mistake? 
but it was real. And in his pocket, he had a letter that he'd received at the hotel that morning from his mother, who was a widowed landowner who paid taxes and said, don't forget to be a good boy. You know, I've been waiting to see how you stood and I haven't noticed anything yet. And so he did it for his mom. And uh, so that's kind of fascinating too, but then to roll out the end of it to sort of also flesh out that just because this amendment passed, you know, voting rights, this was not <laughs> done. Mm-mm. That it wasn't until 1948 that Native Americans could vote in all 50 states in the US, that it, the Voting Rights, of ni- voting rights Act of 1965 mm-hmm. ensured mm-hmm. that people weren't, repra- but even then we still have issues today, right? Yeah. So. So the fight continues and we sort of end with that that two mottos. So there's lifting as we climb onward and upward we go. This this uh, These few lines taken from a speech by Mary Church Terrell, who was uh, a black suffragist who was the only that we know of. I mean, her daughter joined her, but her and her daughter stood with the silent sentinels sometimes out, out front of the White House, which is a big thing. Um, and then the, the motto of the National Women's Party, which was... Um, forward out of darkness, leave behind the night, mm. forward out of error, forward into light. And so those two texts sort of weave together in a partnerish type way at the end. Oh, that's okay. Um, when are you publishing this? Oh, I wish I knew. Um, <laughs> there, are, there are almost 30 courses in the consortium, which is amazing in itself and exciting. And I want to make sure they all have a fair shot at their premieres. Mm-hmm. And of course, mm-hmm. I finished the piece in August, the pandemic hit. You know, well before that, I was writing through the summer of the pandemic, and uh, so everybody's kind of coming back online their own ways in their own time, and so it may be a while before it's available to everyone, just to be respectful mm-hmm. to the people who help make it happen right. and let them have their moment. And I, I hope people like it. It's a very unusual work in that the narration, and I didn't intend this, the narration is every bit as important as anything musical that's happening. Oh, that's important. And when I started it. Huh? That's important for the performers to know. That well, it's in the notes. Yeah. And I say, don't. this is not a thing where you bring the narrator in for your dress rehearsal. They need to rehearse with you through the whole thing for the timing. Because once I got in, it was sort of like, well, do I not tell the stories? And do I just keep this <laughs> an artsy thing and people can do? And I just thought, no, I never knew these stories. And I want the audience to leave going, oh my gosh, it just got a history lesson. Mm. Like I heard beautiful music, but I got a history lesson. And so I do have a fear that my choral friends will be like, I wish the narrator would just shut up because I think the narrator talks more than, and, and for that reason, it almost feels like a choral documentary. Like it feels like something different than, I don't know. I don't know a work. I mean, I, and I don't say this with any pretense or I did something that nobody's ever done before. Cause I don't feel that way. I mean, musically anything that's in that score has been done before somewhere else, but I do feel like it's a different format than I've seen. I don't think I've seen anything where it's like, where the narrator plays that big of a role. And I don't know, it feels almost dramatic in some ways. Um, You're living in your own skin and you're being you, which is so perfect. (laughs) I guess so. I'm so excited for this. Like hearing, Oh, I feel honored that I get to hear the inside scoop of all this. Well, there's, I, yeah, it was, it was quite a um, summer to be writing in a pandemic because mm. I hit a wall. I thought, I don't think anyone's going to hear this. Like I got really down for a bit. Because mm. uh, I thought, you know, to find that motivation. And then, uh, and then honestly, I, I, I came out of that funk thanks to Iris Levine um, with Vox Femina in Los Angeles. And she, she called, I had a Zoom, I was supposed to have a Zoom with her choir on a Tuesday. And she said, can you and I just talk on Sunday? And that really worried me because I thought she's going to, say you know we're just not gonna be able to pull this off and I and I was already feeling so down about all the other canceled premieres and um because there's every composer right now has a ton of pieces that are just sort of in choral purgatory Mm -hmm. and so yeah so I I was feeling down and then when she called it wasn't that at all it was really audacious she said we we are committed to this work we want to turn it into a a a choral documentary film And here's how we're going to do it. And so they socially distanced their instrumentalists. They had union workers who were wiping things down with plexiglass. Iris had a click track in her ear, you know, which was great until the sound hit the plexiglass and goes everywhere. So they had all of these things to figure out. And and then the singers, um, they had lead singers who had learned it and recorded tracks. 
for the other members of the choir and the other choir members were learning from those leads. And then they still got singers to come out and they went to all these beautiful sites in LA and socially distanced them. So they would play the recordings to the singers <laughs> just so it didn't feel like a Zoom choir because everybody was sort of like, we don't want it, we want it to be the real. Zoom choir. So yeah. they would be like singing or like lip syncing or singing very quietly with themselves in these beautiful places in LA so that when the film came together, you get these great shots of the women and it feels choral in the way that we know choral more, more so than just Boxes. Choir, yeah. yeah. Oh, that's beautiful. And to see that you got through that inspiration, that that blockage, and you got to the side with a beautiful product. Are you gonna do another major work, extended work? I, you know, I would love to. Um, I don't know. It's a weird thing because I have been waiting so long to do this, and then now that it's done, I have been thinking that I, I need a new dream. Like I don't have. I like I finished this this dream. Like what's my next? thing and so I, I'm just kind of trying to be open to the universe like what's what's the next uh what, where are we going next because I I don't I don't know yet but I think when I I will say when I finished the proofing of all of those instrumental parts and all of the other thing I thought I'm never doing this again <laughs> and then, then after I saw the performance and how it came together and how much I grew through the process I just I thought no I, I will do this again just not right away um, that's awesome hey I always let the guest at the very end share a a thing that matters one thing you want the listener to walk away from this with you have left us with so many things to think about so many great stories of who you are and how we can take your music to the next level and I know I'm going to be excited when Suffrage Cantata is officially published and everyone can do it and I can't wait to see all the consortium people perform what would be the one thing you want the listener to remember from this conversation? I don't know how well this will hold because hopefully we'll be finding our way out of the pandemic that we're in right now eventually. But something I've been trying to do for myself, it's really hard because creativity is weird right now. I feel like my flow and my typical work pace is not normal, but is to just give myself grace and to just say, this has become a mantra, like good enough is, is the new perfect for right now. Mm -hmm. and that, um, and I told, I told some, some people recently I was presenting and I said, I, I, I think perfectionism in this season right now, like borders on self abuse mm -hmm. because we can be so wrapped up and it, it's just hard. Our brains are dealing with so many things right now. Our, your body your, your, your mind is trying to keep you safe and secure. And that takes a lot of brain power. Mm -hmm. And so it's okay. You just do your best and you keep moving. Um, because it, 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 this is like not ideal for anyone and everyone's struggling in different ways. But I think that's the thing is to just give yourself grace right now. Oh, you are wonderful. I am so thankful that you had time to do this. Thank you for sharing you and for coming on the show. No, it's a treat. Thanks for letting me go on and on. And I hope that you have some, some stuff that works here. <laughs> Just to recap a few of these amazing life lessons from the one and only Andrea Ramsey. Ask questions. Look for things that can inspire you. Don't wait to be hit upside the head. Just be aware and keep looking. If you're on the tracks and there's too many train cars behind you, change tracks, remove a car. If you're not happy on that track, it's okay. If you are wanting to do something hard, just do it. Jump in and get it done. I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Andrea Ramsey as much as I enjoyed chatting with her. She is such a gem. And you also, my friend, you are a gem. So in case you've forgotten, what you're doing really matters. We all know that music matters. And I'll see you next time on the Music It Matters podcast. <laughs>